Elizabeth Wood. And our very special guest for uh, today's show, Catherine Hardwick. <laughs> and our moderator for the conversation, please welcome Jen Yamato from the Daily Beast. Thank you all for staying. And can we please have another round of applause for this fucking amazing, bold, fearless debut. Elizabeth, I have to ask, um, what were your college years like? I don't remember. Uh, take us through uh, the, the inception of the story, um, why this was so important to you to tell that you made it your directorial debut. Sure, this is inspired by real events. Again, it's not a documentary, it's not my biopic, it's a movie. <laughs> but while this real life experience was happening, I didn't know it would be my first film. I just needed time to figure out um, what the fuck happened. And I also had to figure out how to make a movie, which turns out to be kind of complicated. Yeah. <laughs> And Catherine, um, obviously there's a, a, a wonderful parallel in having you here as well. You made your directorial debut with 13, which is another amazingly bold vision of, of young womanhood pushing and testing boundaries. And you won the Sundance Directing Award for that. Um, but tell us, like, when you watch this film, do, do you feel a kinship to this kind of story? Definitely, and I felt, you know, lots of uh, flashbacks, post-traumatic stress syndrome, you know, <laughs> thinking, you know, because it does take a lot of courage to do this in a way, especially if you put it out there and say, this is somehow related to my life, and what are the comments that are going to come back, and, you know, make, it's a very bold thing. In my case, it was with Nikki Reed, and, you know, we got sent to media training, so we would deal with questions like that, like, how close is it to Nikki's real life? And I don't know, did anybody send you to media training yet? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> yeah. So when we, when, when we do talk about, you know, the, the seeds of whatever happened in your, in your actual life that made it into the film, like, we see Leah, for example, experiencing all of this crazy madness in a relatively short amount of time and only at the very end does she maybe begin to process it. Um, how did you relate to that, you know, the, even the processing of, of things and ideas and realities like this? Sure, I think that's why it took a number of years to write the script, to make the film, because I think it's like complicated and for me, like making films, I'm interested in making very personal films or like an act of exploring myself. It's just like a really egotistical, probably a very expensive form of therapy. But I feel like the best inspiration for me comes from my life. And life is so much weirder than a movie anyway. Like the real life experience, if you had actually been up there, it'd just be like, yeah, right. Like at the end, if the roommate was pregnant, you'd be like, come on. But that was real life, you know, it's weirder. What's the, what's the realest thing? If you can just isolate one thing, what's the realest thing in this film? The realest thing? I don't know, that, um, that dick looked really big on the screen, right? Like, I was like, oh I'm my really God, that's editing. It was like this big, but like, like Justin Bartha's dick up there is bigger than like all three of us put together. <laughs> He'd be so happy to hear that too. And is that official confirmation for the first time? Is that an exclusive confirmation that that is Justin Bartha's that real? Is definitely Justin Bartha's real dick. Thank you, that will now be added to the Wikipedia page for this, for this film. Um, tell me about casting Morgan Saylor, who is tremendous and absolutely fearless in what it, I can only assume would be, yeah. would, be um, would seem like a really kind of scary and daunting, risky role for any young actress to take. Yeah, I mean, I am so happy to have found her. I was, really wanted someone who was actually that young. She was 19 when we filmed. She turned 20 during one of the days of shooting who would be willing to take on this material. I found that there were a number of actresses a bit older who were prepared, but to find someone that actually still had that youthful innocence, that like beautiful naivete, um, was difficult. And also who's so intelligent and brought 
so much to the role. She's studying math right now of university, at University <laughs> of Chicago. And she did these like complex uh, diagrams, these equations of her emotions. So when we were shooting like out of order, she'd go back to like where on the, like, the X and Y axis. I was like, what the hell is that? But it worked for her. And she's a very dear friend now. And we had the luxury of rehearsing months leading up to filming. And so she was just a dream all around. Maybe, oh, sorry. oh I wanted to ask, um, did you do like chemistry reads for uh, Blue or did you just cast them separately or? Um, I uh, did have them do a chemistry read, but I didn't really care what their opinions of each other were. <laughs> In fact, I don't know that they hit it off at first. And I'm like, good, like work through that tension. You know, this isn't like super cozy. You're not like, you know, watching movies together. So like work it out when you fuck against the wall, guys. Well. <laughs> Catherine, you, you had one of the most famous chemistry reads uh, in modern movies on Twilight. Right. And so maybe you yeah. can... Yeah. Yeah. It in was your on own my home, bed. Right? It was on my bed. They on your bed. They for the first time. <laughs> and look what magical <laughs> uh, fruit that but bore. But Nikki Reed and Evan Rachel Wood also auditioned on my bed for 13 and kissed on my bed for the first time, too. So, yeah. <laughs> It's a very powerful bed you have. Uh, both of you, I would love to hear, uh, in these respective situations, how do you know when the chemistry is right? Like if, you, you, Elizabeth, you described a situation where even if they didn't know, you knew it was right. Yeah, because it's my movie, not theirs, so they can make their own. Um, I don't know, how do you know when you're in love, right? You know, like, how do you know when someone's right for anything, you just know? They like both had something that I was interested in like exploiting on the big screen. And uh, we did that. Can you talk about the casting of uh, your supporting cast as well? Because um, uh, Brian is a really good example of um, a character that I believe you had a very specific vision of. And was it difficult to cast specifically like a Puerto Rican character? Oh yes, that's um, a good story. And why that was important. Yeah, well. Like, it was really hard to come up with a lot of, like, Puerto Rican actors to audition. And I came out to L.A. for one meeting, and sorry, agents in the audience, but uh, they were like, uh, what about uh, Little Romeo? I'm like, he's black. They're like, what about Dave Franco? I'm like, he's white. I'm like, <laughs> like but, you know, does it matter? I'm like, yeah, it matters. This is a Puerto Rican character, you know. And uh, a friend at... Let's see. Puerto Rico. Um, a friend at... Genius.com, like Rap Genius, we said, are there any Puerto Rican musicians? We're like, yeah, everyone loves this rapper scene. So he came in and read for it. It's his first time to audition for something. And he memorized the whole script to come into the audition. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and you could tell, like, how he's taking it very seriously. You know? Yeah. He was just about to have a baby, like, the first day we were shooting. And so we were like, oh, is that, like, bad timing? But we're like, you know, if he wants to do it, we're not going to get in his way. You know, I'm not going to be sexist, you know. It was a very baby-inclusive production, wasn't it? Oh, yes. I, too, had a, a newborn while making this film. So whenever the guys on set gave me shit, I'm like, I breastfed all night. Like, I don't really care what you say to me right now. Um, tell me through, uh, about the, the development process. I understand you had this script for a, a while, and you were working on it, um, trying to get it financed. How challenging was it to find the right backers for this? And, and how did you finally, I guess, come across killer films? It was completely hopeless to find backers for the film. In fact, I failed mostly, but somehow we still worked it out. No, uh, first, good friends of mine, Henry Joost. Are you here, Henry? Rude, because you were supposed to be here. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> um, Ariel Shulman, their director's nerve was just is in theaters now, and they made Catfish, read the script, and they were like, oh, we'd love to executive produce it. Um, and they took it to Killer, and that was my first meeting ever, and they were like, cool, let's make it. I'm like, cool, okay, uh, great. And then my um, husband is the producer, um, and we had a number of all these meetings. Will you give us the money? Sure, maybe, no. Your first time director, how the fuck do we know you'll do anything? And so. Several times someone said, sure, and like, it got as far as like, thinking the check was coming the next day one time when they pulled out. Um, you know, my child was also a pullout. I need to keep it together. Um, 
<laughs> Comedy, with, okay. Uh, uh, so, this is supposed to be filmed in August, so it was sweaty. I wanted July, we're like, okay, August. It was now September, and I'm like, I give up, maybe next year. Um, and then my husband, the producer, said, no, we're fucking making it, and just went around and like begged many different people to fund it. And also we cut 30 pages and nearly half a million dollars off the budget so that we could make it, so we could make it. Um, so we ended up shooting in October and I feel like it looks pretty warm, right? Like it looks, yeah. it was fucking freezing. When they were on the roof, it was sleeting. Um, when the last fight scene on the street, it was like, we had, it was a pickup, negative five degrees and a wind chill of like much more than that. And we had to like de-ice the sidewalk. So, oh, and also all the leaves were falling. We were like leaf blowing and changing the color in post. It's like a mer <laughs> we got by like the second before the first blizzard. And obviously you shot on location. Yes, most of the film takes place in the real block where it existed. The uh, Blue's grandmother's house was really one of the characters' real homes. Um, yeah, the deli was the real deli. Talk about the importance of, of location specifically uh, to the story, which is this also you know, a story about gentrification uh, in New York and youth moving into new worlds. Uh, that I about location and gentrification? Is that your question? Well, why was it important to you to keep that specific setting? Um, um, well, I feel like Living in New York and having to translate that onto screen is a challenge. And it's important to me that for anyone else living in New York that it felt authentic. And so finding locations that we could afford and that would also seem realistic was challenging. Um, and in terms of seeing accurate for like where the hipsters move to like, you know, gentrify, like um, you have to like find the right dynamic of the neighborhood. So we also couldn't really show that much because we couldn't really like shut down whole streets or anything. So it's a very delicate balance. Um, Elizabeth and Catherine, would you talk a little bit about the experience of uh, making your first films, uh, shopping these stories around that are about really very daringly sexual beings, these like young women just beginning to explore themselves. Did you receive very much pushback or resistance? Oh yeah, same thing. I mean, everybody said, no way, we're not gonna make a movie. And I really appreciate what you said of having somebody the right age for that character. I was determined I was gonna have, make it quickly with Nikki Reed when she would still be 13 years old. Well, she had turned 14 the month before. And then Evan Rachel Wood was 14, so they were very close to it. And, and it was, and people said, we'll never, why would we finance a movie R-rated with 13-year-old girls, a star? But if you make it somehow and it's really good and it goes to Sundance, then we'll buy it. But they wouldn't support it. <laughs> so begging was the thing. I mean, literally tears and yeah. <laughs> it's a good weapon. And Elizabeth, yourself, when you were describing this project to people, potential collaborators, potential financiers, was the, the, the content ever an issue for, for people? Sure, I had like the worst meeting I ever had. Some guys like, what the fuck is this movie? No one's gonna ever fucking make it. Like, give me a break. Like, maybe you should do something else. Who is that guy? Adam, I don't know. I probably shouldn't say his name. But uh, <laughs> no, no, he wasn't Adam. I was asking Adam, but uh, um, <laughs> he's a jerk. But I think in general, I was protected to that. I was going on meetings with people that were interested. Yeah, there were a few bad apples though. <laughs> so the reviews at Sundance come out and I, you know, like it, it was really interesting to see the reception at Sundance be so somewhat polarizing among m seemingly mostly male critics. And I feel like you look at the reviews that came out in January and um, like for example, the film's been compared to kids which I think, depending on your estimation of Larry Clark and kids, is either like a, a, hu like a wonderful thing or, or like a, you know, like not so favorable. I think this is a brilliant film. And I think a lot of those early reviews, which tend to be from mostly men, are kind of missing the point. So what would you say to, you know, the, the, the folks who, who want to 
protect Leah, for example, from herself rather than let her explore and you know, learn the consequences of that? Well, you know, I had this idea in my mind that it was going to be women somehow that would have a problem with it. And I realized how sexist I was being because, of course, it's been men that, you know, so far, I'm sure I'll have more people that hate it, but so far, just a handful of white men who are like, this is exploitative, this is like, you're just trying to like shock us, where in general, women have connected to the sexuality and said that it's not unlike their experience, um, what it's like just to have sex, like big deal. And I feel like the film is kind of about, it's, it's more important that it's about, you know, race and whiteness and gentrification and gender and, you know, all these other things. So it's like, if you get held up by sex, then I think it's a personal issue. I want to, can I ask a question? Uh, I want to ask about, you know, because it's always interesting, you know, when you're directing a sex scene, how did you create that beautiful last scene and the moments of intimacy? Do you give a lot of direction? Just curious, you know, how? Yeah, it's, uh, I feel like it was a lot of talking beforehand of like, what's okay, what's not, what your boundaries are, believe it or not, Morgan Taylor had boundaries. Um, and making a lot of jokes. Um, if it ever felt particularly tense, one of my tricks is to like literally act it out. So like, then, you know, then spread your legs and like grab his ass and then like, ha, 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 okay. And then if they get like comfortable enough, then they go for it. But um, yeah, they were still, Difficult scenes to film, um, but sometimes I'd remember when I felt like, oh, this is so tense, this is terrible, I'm like torturing these people, I'm like, oh, but that'll be good on screen, torture them, you know? <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, usually just a lot of really dirty jokes. Um, I would like to hear about the, the camera style that you use, because it's so wonderfully natural and everything unfolds, like, there are scenes that unfold so naturally that you don't even notice how brilliant the camera movements are, that the camera is capturing very specific glances or movements or watching specific Detail. people. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but it's done so, so almost effortless, uh, effortlessly. So can you describe sort of your approach, your, your visual approach to that? Sure. Well, the DP, Michael Simmons, is incredible. Um, I had a professor at Columbia, Ramin Barani, who made Chop Chop and Goodbye Solo and uh, you know, whatever the other one was. And Simmons came in and did, like, a master class. I was like, oh, he's amazing. I would do anything to, like, work with him on my first film. And then when my uh, first EP actually had a personal tragedy in his life, I called up Simmons and met with him. It's like, yeah, let's do it. Um, he's an absolute rock star. He slept on the set the entire time. Like, he doesn't sleep. He's just, like, a madman. But we didn't storyboard. We would watch movies together to prepare, but usually we'd just get drunk and fall asleep and be like, well, yeah, something like that. Um, but he really helped me feel comfortable to take my time and actually taught me a really good technique of making everyone speak about what was gonna happen in the scene and we all block it and we all like decide what's important that would oftentimes lead to changing the script or the story at the last minute and just has really fucking good ideas. So he was like such an important collaborator to make me feel confident in working with all these people that had made tons of films and this is my first film. There's a scene that I really love and I, I just noticed it again watching it here today. It's the scene where it's the morning after the first club night and um, Blue kicks his friends out of the car and that scene just unfolds in front of our yeah. eyes and it's so beautiful and so, so, so beautifully choreographed. How did you put that scene together, for example? Did you rehearse very much the movements and... and um, I mean, we'd rehearse as we were there, right? I don't know, it just happened. We would plan where the camera was going to go. He'd try something to show it to me. I'd say, like, yay or nay. But uh, we tried to do things in as like, long shots as possible. So, and let the action play out so it could be natural. I'm, I, I'm happy doing like 34 takes if it takes 34 takes because I know that it's usually the 34th that works for me. You know, I feel like I, I know when we have it. It's a waste of everyone's time. If we're in a hurry to get to the next thing, we didn't even get the damn shot yet. Then like everyone can like just go home because the movie's gonna suck. So take your time. So you shot out of order. What was the first and the last scene that you shot? The 
first scene was when they pull up in the morning before they go in to get all the drugs. And uh, it's actually not here, but it wasn't in the script. They were in the car about to get out. And I said, okay, guys, just start making out. Rip off a shirt. And they're like, that wasn't in the script. I'm like, yeah, okay, just go for it. So they were like, okay, good morning, day one. <laughs> and I, I didn't use it. I, didn't, I knew I wouldn't use it, but I just wanted to get them a little bit, you know, warmed up. I'm like, because I know they just fucked in the previous scene. I'm like, you need, like, a little rosy flush about you. And then... Um, right after that, the scene when they hung out on the stoop, and he's like, you got a man, shorty, you know, that one. then that, which is Morgan Saylor's favorite scene, she told me yesterday. And the last thing we shot was when they meet on the street, and she asked them for drugs. And that was October 31st, and it was 5 a.m., and it was, uh, I think, like 13 degrees outside, and our cinematographer was hallucinating. <laughs> I'm like, well, we're going to go home soon. And that was it. But it was cute. But they got to meet in the last moments. Now, you said you rehearsed um, months before. How did that work? Or how did that work? Yeah, I started meeting with Morgan Saylor about once a week. And we did, like, a variety of, like, video exercises. Getting, She's very much not an exhibitionist. So I was like, OK, uh, film yourself dancing on the train. Like, she did one where she filmed herself, like, Stripping and dancing for me. I always beg her to put it like special features on the DVD. She says, no, I'm going to keep begging because it's really good. Um, then we like went out to a club with her in character and brought all this fake Coke and put it out. She'd like do it. And people were like, yo, can I get a bump? We're like, sure, have some vitamin B. They didn't complain. Um, but then we were able to bring the whole group in, his friends and her roommate, and just have a lot of hangouts just to like establish a relationship many of which took place on the real roof where it happened. So to kind of get in the summer mood of Ridgewood, Queens. And uh, just a brief pause to let you guys know we're going to open the Q&A up to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, I believe Charlie Ref is going to give us some directions. So if you, anyone have questions, raise your hand. Oh, perfect. If you do have questions, you'll have to come to me. But you're right here. <laughs> He ain't coming to you. <laughs> first question, a lot of pressure. Um, so I just saw it for the first time, but with the name and everything, I feel like a lot of the times when I'm watching like some TV show or movie that I'm supposed to be like really into, that's because <laughs> you know it's an anti-hero. It's like your middle-aged white guy, and like, can you believe that you still like him? And I'm like, everyone loves those guys. And <laughs> and I feel like this was sort of an anti anti-hero movie do you feel like yes no okay um sure <laughs> yes yes thanks <laughs> um just want approval no um anti anti-hero and you know i think what was my question uh <laughs> i think the movie really felt like it was full of good intentions and when you're talking about it, you can tell that you're full of good intentions and it's really about looking for trouble with good intentions <laughs> and for a movie and with the ending do you feel like I guess if you felt like it was therapy did you feel closure did you feel like that did you feel like it was processed do you feel like the movie ends Absolutely not. If anything, um, this process makes everything more complicated. It's a lot of questions, a lot of like fucked up stuff, right? Whiteness, how like shitty white people can be with really good intentions. Um, the self-congratulatory feeling of that. Um, no, it, it just opens so many more questions for me. Sorry, but awesome. <laughs> You're right here. Hey, first of all, I love the movie. It was wonderful. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first would be, did you, you said that you had to figure out how to make a film, so I'm assuming you didn't study film. What did you study? And then um, how long was this in development, like if you were pushing for it, like from script? Um, and did you write it by yourself? So that's three, I guess, sorry. Wrote it by myself, did go to film school, Columbia Screenwriting. Woo! Undergraduate, I studied drugs, and then um, <laughs> I had maybe a draft. I was, I, I started, wrote a little bit, 2009. Uh, finish it 2011, by 2013 had like many more drafts that I was shopping around to yeah. film it in 14 and here I am in 16 and then life will be over soon, I'm, I assume. It was amazing, it was amazing. Okay. 
Elizabeth, I have a follow-up question. How important was it to keep that title, and was that always the title? It was, uh, it was, it, wow, I just saw how crazy this place looks. God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was the title early on. I had one screenwriting professor said, how could you name a film this? Like, no one will read this. This is disgusting. Like, anyway, what white girl would move to a neighborhood and, like, have, date a Puerto Rican? And then, like, I cried in class. I'm like, but it was me. And she was like, oh. <laughs> and then she was really nice to me. And I keep telling this story, hope, hopefully, like, trickles down to her somewhere out there. Um, hi. Um, this is the first time I saw it as well. Uh, wonderful film. And so, I'm over here, by the way, Hi, right here. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, you said like a lot of the script was changed on set or like in rehearsal. Uh, so my question is, how much of the dialogue on screen that we saw was like improvised or thought of in the moment versus actually written beforehand? Sure, it was all scripted, but oftentimes we'd cut. We'd cut, 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 cut. We don't need all that. It starts way later than that. This is the only important thing. And sure, oftentimes the actors reworded it if it sounded more comfortable to them, but it was all scripted. I have a Party quick question. scenes, they kind of just spiraled out of control, though, but yeah. Sorry, I have a quick question for, for both of you, uh, and that is when working with young female actors like this and asking them to do some some you know very daring things, how do you negotiate that? And Catherine, in your experience in, on 13, were there things that you wanted to push farther? Well, even in the audition process, or the first time you meet the person, you've got to be sure that they're okay with this material, they get it, they understand it, they feel it in their bones. And then in my case, the actors were underage. So we actually have strict uh, rules that you could do. In fact, in one scene, we had the welfare worker hiding behind, behind the couch and yelling out, nipple violation, you know, like <laughs> when somebody's fingers got too close to the nipple region or whatever. So it was a little bit more regulated than. <laughs> That's really creepy, isn't it? <laughs> what if somebody was on set screaming nipple violation every time that you shot? We oh, did that. have a SAG babysitter a few days. Who uh, someone reported that everyone's doing coke on the set, and it was the, because we had this uh, this B vitamin. I always say it's the perfect drug for your 30s. Lots of energy. It's not habit forming. You know, it's almost expen as expensive as coke. It's called Incital. And someone that was there thought like we were just like out of control. And then the the SAG person came. I think they 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 enjoyed it too. And they're like, oh, they're fine. We get out of here. But if that was real coke, the budget I assume would be much higher. Yeah, there was not a drug on set. A lot of fake coke. Uh, another question. Yep. In the back. We left the question Hello. corner. So first of all, outstanding work. This story is very tightly assembled. Lose with a wasp a sledgehammer. I'm very curious to know what is in the 30 pages that you had to cut. It was just like a lot more partying. You know what I mean? It was like, <laughs> you think this is excessive? You should have seen the other 30 pages. Like, thank God they were cut. How long was the draft when you started shooting? How long how was the long, shoot? How long was your draft um, on the script? It had been like 115, and the shooting script was 84. Right. Another question over here on the left. Hi, thank you for screening the film. Um, I want to ask you specifically, when you sat down to tell this story, what commentary or subtext did you want to get at specifically about whiteness? whiteness? So Sure. OK, so I just to Well, in general, the, um, I think it was the process of discovering my own whiteness and looking it like in the face for the first time as a college student that really interested me. Uh, when I write, I'm, I don't think I'm trying to think of what I'm trying to say, because I have no idea what I'm trying to say. And I also hesitate in giving any conclusions or the moral takeaway of the film, because I hope everyone has their own take. But um, I think as someone moving, say, from the Midwest to a big city, where for the first time on a day-to-day -day basis, you are interacting with people from much different backgrounds as yourself, it's a wake-up call. and. I think it's really cool that now the term whiteness is like a part of the media, I think really in the last couple years. Um, but even when I was in college, that was a very unfamiliar word to people. And it was like my class at the new school that taught me about it. So 
Um, it's an exploration of what that means of privilege and of being a woman and of one's sexuality and how all these things intertwine. Does that answer your question at all? It does. Feel free to ask me more. If not. I do have a follow-up question. Sure. Um, so for Morgan Saylor's character, would you say, um, do you think it's safe to say that you've portrayed her a bit as a victim and naive, her own naivete, mm -hmm. but at the same time, she was exploring her own sexuality and power within that. So she was playing a bit, playing with fire a little bit. Yeah? Definitely. Say? I mean, it, in some situations, she's a victim. In some situation, I think she's a perpetrator. I think, like, with her good intention, she made a situation worse. And so it's complicated how these power structures work depending who you're with. I think okay. you also see that reflected in the romantic aspect. You know, some people may not see the relationship between Leah and Blue as a romance, but some people will think it's the most romantic. And I think it depends on whose perspective, Leah's or Blue's, that you're looking from. Um, another question. Where are we? Oh, we're running down. Here we are, on the right. Hi, um, I want to congratulate you on such a beautiful, raw film. It seems you're so fearless in making this. I'm wondering what your advice is for anyone who's um, also writing something so personal, especially as I'm a writer, and um, especially as a female trying to shop that around to a largely, like, male-dominated industry that they might not connect with the story as well. It sounds like you've received a lot of resistance. I'm wondering yeah, what your advice is for that. Sure. Well, luckily, uh, women are in style, so you can use this trend. Um, <laughs> second of all, remember that your, I think, uh, my best talking point in meetings was that this was very personal. Anything I lacked in experience, I had, I could talk about in terms of it being just so personal. So um, I like some writing quote. I don't know what it is, but I think about it often. If it feels terrible and embarrassing and shameful to write, you're probably on to something. So make yourself like really suffer, and you're probably doing great. Catherine, maybe you can answer the same well, question. I, I agree. This is a good time um, to be a woman. Let's, well, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> and uh, so go right now, seek out people that would embrace your project. I mean, like Killer Films or all these other female um, funds that are, people are, that are trying to do that. So I think you should go for it and be as real and honest as possible and get out there. And if the more passionate, the more you believe in it, the better chance you have of making other people's, people believe you too. I'd, I'd like to ask both of you, uh, Catherine, if you flash back to the period right after 13 and how the film changed your career um, how it changed the, the perception the industry had of you and your work. Um, and then you obviously moved on to enormous studio projects and, and many other projects. And then, Elizabeth, what it's like for you right now um, in the, the wake of a huge Sundance debut and how you're finding studios or agents or execs or even talent are responding to what you want to do next. She's got something pretty exciting, so go for it. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just trying to focus on writing, which is hard to do right now when there's so much going on. But I'm really excited to tell more stories, so that's hard, and I kind of want some instant gratification. I'm also like tempted to retire. No, um. Did you find that that your phone was ringing off the hook and after Sundance, and what were the reactions like to people who? you know, like potentially might invest in, in your films in the future. Sure, I went on that like round of meetings where you're, I just like drove around late to like every single like studio lot, like, ah, where am I? And you know, you're like, make jokes, ha, ha, ha. And, uh, so, yeah, I mean, does it amount to anything? I don't know. Hopefully someone will pay for my next project. I'll let you know. Um, every project you're sort of starting over in some ways, but if you have an awesome project behind you that gets people excited, certainly it's a lot easier. And I immediately went in and still, you know, I did Lord, directed Lords of Dogtown, the skateboard movie after that. Yeah, which Love was it. super fun. And uh, so, you know, people were excited, but I had to do like 
crazy eight million tricks and build momentum and presentations and everything to get that one greenlit, as I've had to do for every movie. And those studio movies were not that big budget, by the way. <laughs> they were small compared to other budget, yeah. Can I say that also when I watched 13, it was so exciting to me to see a story, which I've seen very few of, of a young woman's actual experience. And I was living on the West Coast at the time, and I'm like, whoa, I lived that. And I feel like there's so few stories that just tell like an honest young woman's like sexual journey that it made me feel like very empowered that I could do the same. All right. <laughs> which is why we made it, you know, because even it was quite scary for Nikki and her mom and myself and everyone to put that out in the world and we did get a lot of love you know people that were shocked that couldn't be true that never happens 13 year olds don't act that way but then even live on the radio I would say really well how old were you when you first had sex and like I remember this reporter in uh, uh, Chicago goes um, 11 <laughs> but people don't want to remember how they were in college or junior high or anything whitewash Revision is history. I think we have time for one more back here. All right. Hi, how you doing? Um, just wanted to know if looking back on, I'm over here. If looking back on the film, if there's anything that you wish you could have done differently or that you would change or maybe if there's anything that you had wanted to do differently that you ended up having to do as what was in the film. Um. When I first started watching it, I was like, I hate it, this is terrible. And then my editor's like, settle down. You're not done with any bit of any of this until you like all of it. And I'm very grateful he said that because I literally didn't stop till I liked every second of it. I worked with him for two months, then uh, the producer, my husband, edited for eight more months. And we literally didn't stop till I was happy with the film. So I would also give that advice with your scripts, with your film, just don't stop till it's ready. Like you're only gonna get someone to look at it once. So like, get it right. That's a cool editor. I like that. And very lastly, before we say goodbye, um, I know you hinted at what you might be doing next, but I'd love to hear what you guys are like thinking about, like what kind of stories you're thinking about right now, and um, if you're working on anything specific that you can tell us about. Um, well, I'm doing three rewrites in a row. <laughs> Hopefully one of those will go. One is with Fox 2000, Love Letters to the Dead, which is also about um, body image, sexuality, girls. A lot, of, a lot of books are written about that right now and a lot of exploration on this same subject. It's a, it's a volatile time for women, I think. So it's exciting, yeah. Fingers crossed. Now I'm working on a 10-part thing. I kind of randomly picked the number 10, but I think it sounds cool. I guess it's for TV or internet or cell phones or wherever people watch things these days. Um, and I'm also writing like a sci-fi apocalyptic romance. Yes, please. I would like that very much. Wait. We have to do, will you take a picture of Catherine and I with everyone in the background for this? Will you guys wave? Will you put your hand in the air? <laughs> awesome. OK. OK. Oh, you have to open it. How do you use these things? Does anyone remember how to use a Polaroid? Got it. Okay, will you put your arms in the air? Please, it'll look so cool. Post it online. You guys will all see it. Oh, yeah, I'm holding mine. My... I'm going to take three. Okay. Here's the first one. Did it work? Oh, okay, sweet. Hopefully that works. Oh, we're going to take another one. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, guys. That's fine. I'm sure that's fine. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Another round of applause for White Girl, Elizabeth Wood. Thank you. Catherine Hardwick, thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, Trevor, for having us. Doesn't he look so cute in a suit, guys? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. One more round of applause for these three incredible women. <laughs>